join news team on an assignment in the Pandai district of the northern region, encounter three persons on a motorbike, the rider and two women. The woman in the middle, heavily pregnant, has been in labor throughout the night. The baby is not coming and she has started to bleed. <laughs> She has to be taken to the hospital, but there is no ambulance or any other means of transport. She therefore has to spend an hour on a motorbike sandwiched between her sister and husband on a dusty and deplorable road. The news team initially planned to observe and film her ordeal, but decide against it and offer her a ride. At the Kwandai Polyclinic, the nurses say her situation has developed complications, but the only obstetrician here is out for a training in Tamale. This necessitates a referral. She has been exhausted. She's tired. She's already tired from the house. And we can't keep her here. Our doctor is not around. So we want to refer her to where there's a doctor. So that if she can't make it now, they will just hasten it for her. Mm. Here too, there's no ambulance and the news team has to transport her to the nearest hospital. At the Evangelical Church Hospital, there is a physician but there are no essential medicines to conduct the caesarean section. The government has not reimbursed the health insurance claims so patients in danger, such as this pregnant woman, have to get their own drugs for the treatment and surgeries. Depending on the time, they, the doctor will they will, no, they will bring the drugs from home. Where's the drug? You don't have drugs. What kind of drugs? The infusions. The infusions, like uh, ranges, normal saline, and then you don't have the different. You don't? Yes. How? Wow. Well, the insurance is owing us, and they are not paying us. <laughs> for the past 18 or 16 months, the insurance is not paying us. So. We are doing our own papa to run the place. Her husband has for the nearest pharmacy. Finally, a baby boy is born and the father immediately names him Kwabanaik Joy. Kwabana because he's born on a Tuesday. Joy because, but for the intervention of Joy News, both mother and baby may have died. Not long after this incident, a frustrated resident of Nangruma, also in the northern region, films the ordeal of another pregnant woman in labor. She has to be carried on a motorbike and at this river, some volunteers have to carry her and the motorbike separately across before the journey continues to the health center. These two incidents are not isolated cases. It's been 62 years since Ghana gained independence, but basic needs such as education and healthcare remain a luxury beyond the imagination of some of its citizens. President Nana Adudankwe Kufuado, who is championing the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda, believes Ghana has more than enough resources to cater for the needs of its citizens. My fellow Ghanaians, ours is a country that is well endowed with many natural resources such as gold, bauxite, iron ore, diamonds, oil, natural gas, timber, cocoa, water, fertile land, etc. The, tru the truth, however, is that the state of our nation does not bear out that we have these natural endowments. Poverty continues to be our lot. Mismanagement, corruption, and high fiscal deficits have become the hallmarks of our economy, which we finance through borrowing and foreign aid. As a people who want to go beyond aid, if one of the things we try to focus on is how to reduce waste, then we can find simple strategies that every decision we make, how do we cut the waste in that? So, yeah, I, I, I agree, but the waste is from many, 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 many areas, yeah. Procurement is the biggest avenue for wastage and corruption in the country, according to various reports, including the annual report 
by the Auditor General. In this documentary, I delve into one area of wastage and problematic procurement which has become a disturbing rhythm in the public sector. I begin from the Institute of Local Government Studies in Medina, a suburb of Accra, where Hyundai Galopa 2 four-wheel drive vehicles have been abandoned for nearly 20 years. The procurement of these vehicles started in 1999, but the contract was signed in 2000. The Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development ordered 110 of the Galupa vehicles for the Metropolitan, Municipal and District Chief Executives. The supplier, Africa Automobile Limited Supply 23 and the remaining 87 were to be supplied after some payments were made. Court documents and correspondence secured as part of these investigations reveal there's no consensus as to whose fault it was that the payments and delivery delayed. In 2001, however, the Auditor General wrote to the Ministry of Local Government ordering the cancellation of the contract and a refund of the monies paid, less the cost of the 23 galopes that had been delivered in 2000. Africa Automobile says the vehicles had already been imported when the Auditor General ordered the cancellation of the contract. The reason for the cancellation was that the contract had not been performed at the agreed time, a claim the company contests. When a contract was signed 19 years ago, the Galopez cost $30,200, US so the 110 vehicles amounted to $3,322,000. The government says it has paid the city equivalent of $2 million. US the supplier, Africa Automobile Limited on its part says the payment amounted to $1,251,000 because the city had depreciated against the dollar at the time it cleared the government checks. In 2005, Africa Automobile Limited sued the government for payment of the balance as well as for collateral damages. The case is still pending in an Accra High Court. A Deputy Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, Kwaku Kwatin has indicated the government intends to auction the vehicles to recover the little it can from the investment. We have done quite a review of the court actions and uh, we take the view that whilst the court actions uh, go on, it is possible within the law to auction the vehicles because they were never cleared and they are still within uh, customs bonded warehouses. And so we will use the applicable laws, auction the vehicles and redeem whatever it is we can redeem from um, those vehicles. It is unclear how much the gallopers will be worth and who will be willing to buy them, but it is evident they have depreciated considerably. The vehicles have not been serviced since they were brought here. Some of them are rusting. Another thing which is unclear is how the court case will end. In 2012, the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development at the time of the contract, Kwamena Ahoy, indicated the company had executed a contract and had a strong case against the government of Ghana. In a press statement, Mr. Ahoy said, In the event that the government is unable to reach an out-of-court settlement with the company, both myself, who negotiated the transaction, and Mrs. Cecilia Johnson, who authorized the installation payment, will have to give evidence for the company against the government. In an earlier unrelated case involving a company called City and Country Waste Limited against the Accra Metropolitan Assembly AMA, in which the NPP government similarly argued that there was no contract in which I was compelled to give evidence for the company against the AMA, damages in excess of $12 million was awarded against the AMA. The AMA appealed against the judgment to the Court of Appeal and to the Supreme Court. It lost in both courts and the amount has become one of the judgment debts that the present government is having to pay. Another problematic procurement that has stalled and resulted in the parking of vehicles for years is the 2012 contract awarded to Dubai-based Big C Trading LLC to supply 200 Mercedes-Benz ambulances. Even though Mercedes-Benz has a franchise holder in Ghana, the contract was single-sourced through Japa at Business Limited, owned by Richard Japa. He was then a special aide to the National Security Advisor, Brigadier General Nuno Mensah. 
It wasn't Gamma that initiated it. We initiated it. So when cabinet settled on the Mercedes and it went to Parliament, automatically it must go to public procurement for sole sourcing because we designed it, we are designing it, we brought the specs, we brought our financial package, we brought everything. So you can't go and give it to another company. Each of the ambulances cost 97,000 euros or 89,000 US dollars. The 200 ambulances therefore amounted to 15 million 800,000 euros or 17 million 803,000 US dollars. The company was supplied and be paid through a letter of credit. According to its representative Richard Jakwa, two ministers who were appointed in 2013, being the Minister of Finance, Sir Jakwa, and the Health Minister, Sherry Aite, both frustrated the contract. He told Joy News of his first encounter with Madam Sherry Aite. When I went to the office first, I said, oh, we've written and you are supposed to send your technical man for inspection. And the one week is passing. It's passing. I'm not hearing anything. Then he said, oh, that uh, the ambulance, I should tell my people to come and meet her halfway. And I said, oh, ma, what do you mean by we should meet you halfway? Then so what? Uh, we're a businessman. You should understand what I mean by you should meet us halfway. And I said, ma, me, I don't understand what you mean by that, unless you explain to me. Then so well, if I don't understand, then that's my problem. She's, they are not, she's not interested in the uh, ambulances anymore. And I said, oh, ma, you can't say you are not interested. The ambulances are not for you. Seth Tekwe has denied Mr. Jakwa's accusation of deliberately frustrating the contract. Sherry Aite has declined to respond directly to the accusations. She, however, said she could be quoted as saying Rachel Jakwa came to insult her in her office. She's not talking about the contracts and specifications of the ambulance, that's not what she's talking about. She's talking about the letter of credit, which is the money negotiation payment. So we should meet, come for renegotiation in that aspect. Some of them don't like to be told the naked truth about governance when they are espousing their ignorance and their intransigence. They don't want to be told the truth in their faces. But I told her, because this is my business. In 2014 and 2015, the company supplied 30 of the ambulances and received a payment of 2,370,000 euros. The ambulances are still parked at the Air Force Base in Bemakam since they were relocated there in 2016. The ambulances, the, the 30 badge arrived in 2015 and some months, the accessories also arrived in 2016. And they have been at the port up to date. But the ambulances are somewhere. The ambulances have, were cleared. Initially, they were parked in front of Parliament House. Then, when the brouhaha started in the previous government, prior to the election, they felt politically it will not be it will be uh, uh, it will be uh, it will be politically incorrect towards election to continue to leave them at the Parliament House for people to be looking at it. It wasn't good for politics, so they moved them into a military zone, Air Force Base outside the eyes of guardians to keep them there so that people will stop talking about it and we can go for the election. Mr. Jakwa says the cost of the vehicles has gone up due to the delay, but his company is willing to continue with the supplies should this government issue the letters of credit. This is a concession we made. I told them that, look, we will give you, we are prepared to give you the new models. The new models with all the expensive new things in it which is about 20,000 euros more each unit, at no cost to government. We will bear that cost. Okay. And then additionally, the assessors at the port, which you have refused to clear, which is supposed to be in demo range over three years now, we are still going to go ahead and bear that cost for you. Clear it and fix them in the, in the ambulances and test drive them. So we made these two concessions for them, which is huge. And that's going to be for all the 200 that is going to be for all the remaining 170 ambulances. We are bearing all that huge cost. With the condition that they will proceed to establish the LC for the rest of the 170 ambulances are still the same old price. So how much will we be looking at roughly as additional cost to you, the pro producers or the Supplies. Oh, we are looking. We are we are we are we are looking of around, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 3.2, 3.3 million euros 
additional, Addi additional cost. costs. Which you are prepared to bear. We are prepared to bear the cost. You are a business person and not a philanthropist. Doesn't this feed into <laughs> the perception or the allegation that the original cost was highly inflated? For which reason, with this additional cost you are prepared to bear, you are still going to make your profit? We weren't that much concerned about profit making in the supply. That is why you get a Mercedes with all those almost like a hospital accessories at that price. I can confidently tell you here that we are not making profit on this project. We will make our profit in the servicing. You were not making profit at the original? The original, we were making profit, marginal profit, right? We were making very marginal profit that we were going to make out of that project because we have to build maintenance workshops we have to so was it train up, 600 was, paramedics. Was your profit up to the 3.2 million euros? Oh, that one's a uh, trade business issues because you have your principals in the uh, foreign country. You have agency non-disclosure, non-circumvention agreements. So those are not things I can come and discuss them with you. I'm, I asking, you I'm asking because <laughs> if a businessman is willing to give away 3.2 million euros out of a 15.8 million euro contract, then that tells you a lot. No, you see, when you even go into, let's say, uh, construction, for instance, construction, when contracts are awarded to companies, the profit margin is always around between 15, 15 to 20 percent. Beyond the delay, however, it appears there are technical problems with the ambulances. As part of this investigation, Joy News secured a 2016 inspection report on the ambulances written by Carl Fredericks, GmbH, a German company specialized in car bodies and vehicles. The report identified as many as 18 defects on the ambulances converted by the Dubai-based company. These are 1. Wrong specification of base units not suitable for conversion into ambulances. 3. VIN number shows specification for UAE market. 4. Codes of the vehicle suitable for minibus conversion. 5. Mix of old type of MB Sprinter and MB Sprinter facelift. 6. Electronic devices and equipment are of very poor quality. 7. Electronic system is mounted dangerously. 8. No medical first delivery equipment. 9. Medical storage compartment are not lockable. First parts are missing. 10. Doctor's chair not properly fixed. Shaking. 11. No AC for patient compartment. 12. No sterilizer in rear compartment. 13. Stretcher not solid. Not working when patient is on transport. 14. Floor systems of vehicles not according to Dilma bodybuilder regulations. 15. No isolation of the rear compartments. 16. No proper fixation of equipment as well as paneling. 17. Euro 4 engine not suitable for Ghana. 18. Vehicles produced in 2013 which warranty expires after three years even without usage. The experts concluded that the ambulances were only suitable for conversion into 13-seater minibuses. But Richard Jabka says the report is bogus and was championed by his competitors. They went and got our competitor, Silver Star, to write some nonsense thing because they want to kill our business and they want it. And said they are unfit, they are, they are supposed to be used for trotro and all those kind of nonsense. According to him, the Ministry of Health had the option to inspect the ambulances before the shipping and not after the shipping. Clause 7.1. This contract has said, that's by the same government. Too. They put here pre shipment inspection. The purchaser shall undertake, which is government, the purchaser, undertake pre shipment inspection in accordance with the technical specifications which has been mentioned in car specification, list conversion specification. So the contract for the ambulances is conversion from an existing already made vehicle that you convert into ambulance. This is a contract government signed with us. And that is what we are doing. 
and medical equipment list which are annexed here a b and c of this agreement the annexes are back here it went further 7.2 seven days prior to each shipment the supplier will send a notice for the purchaser to pre-inspect the vehicles this is what government you put in your own contract nowhere in the contract did you put post delivery inspection we didn't draft the contract so if in your wisdom you thought there was a need for post delivery inspection you shall put in your contract before we signed Mr. Jakpa has revealed some consumables and removable parts of the ambulances were not included because the suppliers feared the Ministry of Health officials would steal them. We know they were going to steal them. We didn't want those stories because of the behavior of the ministry and their technical people in the ministry. So we just removed the accessories. And they are not things that you need to weld, no. They are things that this, you, you fix it just like removing a, cap, a, a charger plug. You just decoplate them, put them in a container. Those loose accessories that are lying in the compartments that have been compartmentalized. You just open them, push them aside, remove all of them, put them in a container. And just leave the ambulance designed as it is with all the fixed design inside. The Ministry of Health has indicated it is still in talks with the suppliers to resolve the differences and find the way forward. Elom Ametepe speaks for the Ministry. The Ministry has been holding meetings with the... Big C, uh, the agent of Big C General Trading Limited, um, for some time now, trying to find um, a solution to the problem. And the meetings have been going on. But um, what we're also looking forward to the resolution of the issue amicably. But in the event that there is no headway, then the ministry will consider terminating the contracts and then take steps to recover the monies that have been um, paid to him. While this tussle continues, ordinary Ghanaians, especially accident victims and pregnant women, continue to bear the brunt of the shortage of ambulances. There are about 50 ambulances for Ghana's population of nearly 30 million, but we need at least 500 ambulances. That is according to the Operations Director of the National Ambulance Service, Foster Anson Bridgen. Imagine somebody uh, a maternal case where somebody is really uh, labor and he is, she is in labor and there is no ambulance where there is complications. You need to transport a person from a health center to a district hospital or to the regional hospital for interventions. But they will call and there is no ambulance available. It is very, very difficult. And you see, the personnel are eager to help, but the tool that they will use to be able to help, the tool is not available. It appears the politicians and government officials who take these decisions do not suffer the same predicament of the ordinary people. Five kilometers away from the scene of the accident is the Winnie Trauma and Specialist Hospital. The dead and the injured were rushed to the hospital. Medical superintendent of the hospital, Dr. Douglas Amponsa says, the lack of ambulance makes it difficult to save lives in situations like these and they are working feverishly to save a three-year-old boy whose parents are yet to be found. No ambulance, no family member around. You call National Ambulance, we are not getting them. But clearly this story raises a number of important questions. And no doubt uh, Ghana has a, a serious lack of ambulances, but it also raises the issue of prioritization. Um, we saw just the day before when the Deputy Minister for Communication had an accident that he was airlifted out of the central region to Accra where he's receiving treatment and thankfully responding well to it. Um, but the question is that if we're able to do that for our for a deputy minister, what's the explanation for the reason why we can't do that for a three-year-old child who is battling for his life in Winneba? We are supposed to be able to respond quickly within, the, within seven minutes, but we are unable because we don't have enough ambulances. The abandoned ambulances and 87 gallopers are not the only problematic vehicle procurements the government is currently grappling with.
in the National Security Secretariat Yard behind the Accra International Conference Center, 350 vehicles procured by the state-owned microfinance and small loan center, Maslock, are packed with some of the saloon cars covered with weeds. The vehicles are made up of 133-seater Isuzu buses, 100 Chevy Sparklight saloon cars and 150 Chevy Avio saloon cars. Maslock procured these vehicles in 2016 for the Ghana Private Road Transport Union, but the GPRTU has rejected them. Kwame Kuma is the national chairman of the GPRTU. I brought the calls on point B. Jinawa, or friends, I had twenty cities. I had then I got one million. I brought a point of corona, so it began to be a offense. And only as a man, a high in the course of this investigation. I went to the supplier of the vehicles, Mark Autos and Spare Pass Ghana Limited, for quotations in August 2018, two years after the company sold the vehicles to Maslock. Even though the company's prices of the same vehicles had increased, my investigation revealed that the prices at which the company sold the vehicles to Maslock in 2016 is far higher than the cost at which it sold to the public in 2018. For instance, Mark Ghana sold the 33-seater Isuzu buses to the general public in 2018 at seven. 79,000 US dollars a bus, but sold to Maslock in 2016 at $107,000, a difference of $28,000 a bus. The company sold the Chevy Sparklight saloon cars in 2018 at $9,000, but sold to Maslock at $12,500 US dollars. In 2018, McGana had stopped selling the Chevy Avio saloon cars, but an August 2017 pro forma invoice from the same company with joint news obtained as part of this investigation, quotes the price of each Chevy Avio vehicle at $14,000. However, the company supplied each of the 150 vehicles to Maslock at $18,000. In all, the cost of the vehicle sold to Maslock is higher than the market price of the vehicles by at least $3,750,000 or $18,375,000 Ghana cities. Joy News made several attempts to speak to the CEO of Maslock who Signed the contract, said in Atamaklo Atienu, but we could not get her to comment. When Joy News wrote to Magana for a response, the company denied any wrongdoing. In a letter to Joy News, Magana said, The reasonable difference in prices of the vehicles sold to Maslock and the prices sold to the general public was due to the fact that it was not paid upfront in cash, but over a period of two years. As such, an interest was put on the price as is custom in car purchases. A procurement specialist, Kwabna Atabedu, thinks the prices to Maslock should have been lower since the government was procuring 350 vehicles at a go. You have given market rate today in 2019 or 2018 when you started this investigation. The quotations you are giving to the public as of 2018 is much lower than the rate you gave to government. So where is the discount? Talk less of the, the volumes. So where is the benefit of economies of scale? And when the people who did this contract, what were they thinking? This is causing financial loss. He says the government committed a series of anomalies in this transaction. How come government decided that we are going to go to Mark and that is what we will give you? That is a red flag for me. Number two, why should it be a sole source or a single source? And where is the approval? Did they get PPA to do an approval for that single source? Now, if PPA did an approval for that single source, what kind of due diligence did they do before they decided to give them the approval? Because if I look at the analysis here, they quoted in CD. The contract was given out in Ghana CD. We have ended up paying in USD as against the contract. That itself is a flaw on government's part. The current CEO of Maslock, Stephen Amwa, believes the amounts put on contracts in Ghana are generally too high. But when people intentionally, when the system is so corrupt that now it's like, it's like culture, almost every system, not only NDC and PP, not only CPP, almost every unit in Ghana, the corrupt practices form a greater part of, of, of the pie chart. And that is where some of us get very emotional because with this, what can we do? 
and it's all over. People take and they go away. They do whatever they want. I know all over there were businesses. They have lobbying fee. So you might have thought of some small margin to manage the transactions that went on. Even America, they have lobbying fee. Whether it's wrong or right, I don't know. But a situation where just by observation, amounts that are added, Sometimes when you think about it, you ask yourself, so do we have mosques and churches in Ghana, like buildings? Citing estimates by the state-owned Architectural and Engineering Services Limited for minor works at Maslok, the current CEO says cost inflation of projects is a common occurrence in the government sector. What is really destroying Ghana is corruption. There's nothing else. Whether NDC, CPP, we have good people who are learned. But why? It's corruption. Why? It's corruption. Our head of his AESL benchmark budget was over 700,000 Ghana cities. I said, no, how? Doing pavement. I know it was quite a wee job, but I had built before, so I know. We did this below 200,000. Wow. Excess of about 500,000 Ghana cities. Whether they were wrong or right, that's not my business. This, the head of his renovated? Yeah, I'm telling you. Wow. So what I'm saying is, this is a small thing. So what I'm saying is, most of our funds go waste. And this thing could have been done very well within the procurement, the administrative part, that you will not even find anything wrong with it. But look at the profit margin. Joy News investigations revealed more anomalies with this contract beyond the prices. We secured a record of all the vehicles imported by Magana from January 2016 to December 2017. We also secured details of the vehicles cleared by the company for which duty was paid within the same period. When the details of the vehicles supplied by Maslock were searched from the vehicles cleared, they were not found. The Ghana Revenue Authority has confirmed that Mac Autos and Spare Pass Ghana Limited did not pay any duty or tax on the 350 vehicles it supplied to Maslock. That duty, according to the GRA, amounts to some 10.5 million Ghana cities or 2 million US dollars. The GRA says it is taking steps to ensure that this anomaly is resolved. Further investigations revealed that the Ministry of Finance had written to waive the duty for the company pending a parliamentary approval which did not happen. Our investigation, however, reveals the company was not entitled to duty waiver according to the terms of the contract it signed with Maslog. Article 32 of the contract states, and I quote, A supplier shall be entirely responsible for all taxes, duties, licenses, fees, etc. incurred until the delivery of the contracted goods to the final destination End of quote. The exemption was not approved by Parliament, and this contravenes Article 174.2 of the Constitution, which states that the power of waiver or variation in favor of any person or authority shall be subject to prior approval of Parliament by resolution. The GPRTU executives say they once paid a courtesy call on former President Mahama and appealed to him to help them acquire vehicles through high purchase. When the president referred them to Maslock, they told the Maslock CEO at the time that that they were already in talks with vehicle suppliers and would want Maslock to use the GPRTU's preferred suppliers. You could share, yeah, ma'am, you know, you share, no, 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 the obeyane say, or friends say, cars, no, one person, no, no, me, be sad, no, say, eh, you're called president, oh, I'm my president, so, oh, boy, na, or friends, oh, mama, ya, 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 to, and no, na, say, say, woka, ya, na, wo, mo, maslok, mo, dia, na, mo, ka, say, mo, de, ba, boy, no, also, President Diana or Kayanam Samami, a Bassadia and Essay, watching Chimmy and Sadia Tuichi. President Tijan, I promise you, my Etia says, Oh, no, a Fresia, a bachelor Kaipe, a brave new company, a BB war negotiation. One me a Kami, a new brand new, a Niza Bacon, a your friends, a HL Bacon, a chair to your ten in Nizasa, or the Bamma say, and try Kano, Nyasha. I'm a Minoka say, then is an Ukrainian general secretary Kuta, and Mobianim Gorgana has to say, Toyota, and in his idea, Obianim say, the current city. Into Sana Wokandia, say, what the uncall for, I call, 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 I call
my friends say anti asiama GPRT says Maslock refused to yield even after the union suggested that its suppliers supply half of the vehicles Maslock decided to procure for them. The same Maslock did not discuss the prices with them or sign any contract before importing the 350 vehicles. I say yeah can you know no not just say eh your friends say this year to two and mahu near the abature said to need and must you didn't your friends say no who mean the two needing so what you say and see minimum she shall be a far a bo and I be beyond Kobina Atabedu says the value of the vehicles that have been left in the sun since 2016 will surely reduce. So we've put those cars there, dumped them in the sun. Since 2016. Since 2016. So 2016, 2017, 2018, now we are in 2019, four years. The part I don't like is even when this happens, at times we use them as a basis to say, pack them whilst we investigate. That only makes the problem worse. It doesn't really solve the problem. You can investigate whilst the buses are being used. But we've done that even to aircraft. There have been situations in this country where we have parked Ghana Airways uh, aircraft and investigated whilst the aircraft is parked. And anybody who understands the airline industry will tell you that each block hour that you have parked that vehicle, you are paying a lot of money. We've, um, uh, uh, we've parked that aircraft. Aircraft are meant to be in the air, not on the ground. But we did that in this country. By the time Maslow gets interested besides the cost, there appears to be something dubious about the timelines of the contract. The contract was signed on December 6, December 6, 2016, but the vehicles were delivered to Maslock starting from November 22, 2016, two weeks before the contract was signed. President Mahama commissioned the vehicles on December 2, 2016, four days before the contract was signed. In all, Maslock has paid $13,550,000 for these vehicles, but the company says there's $2 million more to pay. The current management of Maslock says it has started selling the vehicles on high pitches, but the prices are making it difficult to sell them. It has therefore sought permission from the Minister of Finance to reduce the prices of the vehicles so that they can be sold. For now, it is safe to say there's a way forward for the 350 Maslock vehicles, even though the nation appears shortchanged by at least 28 million cities or 5.6 million US dollars from the cost inflation and the illegal tax exemptions. With a price deduction, the nation may be able to recover part of its investment from the sales. But there's yet another problematic vehicle procurement which raises a lot of questions. The urban transport buses, the Ayalolo bus system. A former transportation planner, now private legal practitioner, David Ofosudote says the urban transport project traces its beginning to the 1990s. Many years ago when I was a, a full-time transportation planner before I stopped to do law practice, I actually worked on a World Bank assignment uh, which looked at poverty worldwide. And Ghana was one of the case countries for poverty. And I we worked under a team leader called Professor Nambia. And I led the team on mobility needs of the poor. So we, what we looked at was how do poor people move around. And among other things, we looked at walking paths around Accra, bicycle paths, uh, people who use all kinds of uh, uh, travel to work. So people who, for example, sit in their buckets of vehicles, they load them like uh, sardines, for want of a better word, to go to work. And all those uh, issues, and then we traced where they originate to where they end. So you will notice that if you take about the fact that at that time, about 63% of all trips to the central business district were emanating from the periphery. And of this, a huge percentage of people of about 50 to 60% were classified as poor. In other words, they fell below a specified poverty line in Ghana. So these things originated from some of these studies way back in the early 90s. I think we ended that study in 95 or so, if I recall. In 2007, the government of Ghana, acting on a World Bank report, initiated the urban transport project to build a more decent transport system in the urban centers. Samson Jamre has been part of the project since 2008. And the Ghana urban transport project was initiated by the government of Ghana, the World Bank, the, the French agency, AFD, and then the Global Environmental Fund. The project started in the year 2007, after state studies had been carried out by the bank in 2005 and 2006. 
David of Usudoti says the strategy was that the private sector would buy and operate the buses. The idea of ensuring that the lessons of the past uh, were corrected. And, and we must, uh, not to, just to, to set this thing in perspective, there's been a lot of interventions in the poor in the, for the poor in the past, nothing really new. We had the Omnibus Service Authority under the Omnibus Licensing Decree of 74, under which the, the district assemblies or the then local government entities were to have cordoned areas to operate these Omnibus services. It didn't quite work. City Express was introduced, or Nibiru Bar Services was introduced. If our Unibus came before uh, City Express, then MMT, uh, then we have the Ayalolo and all the rest. So these are all interventions. But the lessons of the past should have told everybody that the proper way to intervene in this is to introduce some commercial element in it. And then you regulate the fair prices in such a way that the poor can afford. And you license the route which they, they, they use so that they are restricted to those routes where you know that these routes link to the mobility accessibility of socioeconomic activities by the poor. In 2016, President John Mahama commissioned the urban transport system, a compromised form of the bus rapid transit. The legal entity created to manage what became known as the Ayalolo bus system is the Greater Accra Passenger Transport Executive, GAPTI, headed by Samson Jamra. Component one was the institutional development component. That was $14.5 million was allocated to that component. Component two is a traffic engineering management and safety component, which added to $1 million allocated to it. Component three was the bus rapid transit system, which had $46 million allocated to it. Then we have a component four that talks about integration of land development and transport planning, having an allocation of $2 million. And then we have the project outcome and monitoring being allocated $1.5 billion. So the total sum was $95 million okay. for the implementation of this project. Okay. 68 buses were deployed to run the Tudu Amasama route, which had designed stops and some few meters of dedicated bus lanes close to the bus stops. However, after less than two years of operation, the system ran into challenges. Now our buses are caught in traffic, AM traffic, between Amasaman and Ofanko and it spends about almost two hours in that traffic before it is released on the other sectors on the corridor. Then we also face violations of our dedicated facilities by other road users, especially the competing trotters. So all of these add to a very long journey time, which is very unappealing to our commuters. So currently, I need to have on the average 40 passengers in the bus that has a capacity of 85 passengers to be able to break even but we are able to only do 20, 22 passengers per trip per bus, which is woefully inadequate in terms of the revenue base to support the cost of the operations. The government imported a total of 245 buses for the Ayalolo project. Some of these buses have never moved since they came into the country in 2016. The 68 which were used for the pilot project have also been grounded. The World Bank financed the infrastructure components of the project. When Joy News wrote to the bank for comments, the World Bank said it rated the implementation of the project as unsatisfactory. In an email, the bank said, in the post-completion assessment of the project, the bank rated the implementation performance unsatisfactory. The procurement of the buses by the government represented a deviation from the original plan of establishing a limited competitive regime for public transport operations along major routes. The project envisaged that the private sector operators would be responsible for providing the specified quality of buses for operations alongside designated routes based on the route license issued by the regulator. Government intervention of purchasing buses meant that the element of private sector initiative and investment in passenger transport in the bid to improve mobility is lost. According to the World Bank, the business case that emerged assessed 80 buses at the initial requirement. However, government bought 245, more than three times the number. The Ayalolo in its operation has accumulated a debt of 12 million cities. Now, it needs an amount of 20 million cities to begin operations. There is still a hurdle to scale, even if operators of this bus system get the money. Apart from the few meters of dedicated lanes on the Tudu Amasama corridor, the buses will still operate like any commercial vehicle. 
Besides, the bus terminals at the central business district and a major one at Adenta are still under construction more than two years after the operations of the buses began. Our investigation has also revealed that interference from politicians and government officials is the reason Ayelolo could not deal with the trot road drivers who parked and loaded at the dedicated bus lanes and at the Ayelolo bus stops. Each of the Marco Polo low entry city buses cost Ghana 251000 600 US dollars, making the 245 buses 61 million 642 thousand dollars. Together with the cost of developing the infrastructure, the project has cost the nation more than 151 million US dollars or 742 million Ghana cities. Out of this, only 7 million cities is a grant from the Global Environmental Fund. The rest are loans which the nation will pay with interest. And at times, when they think just to parliament, you are not even detailed enough to question and very often remember the majority party is also the government and it's also ministers and then the thing goes through parliament so there have been instances where we have borrowed money and and this is not far-fetched i think in the last few years we've actually requested for world bank money which i'm sure we have received to big build dock kennels for for entities like the ghana revenue authority there are uh, monies we've borrowed to build toilets in houses in Tishi, uh, some of which have never been built yet we are paying these monies. And the second part which makes these things worse is that we don't have the system to draw down the money. And we pay on unutilized money. My, my estimate is that on the average, we leave about 40, 30 to 40% of monies allocated by donor agencies not drawn down. The only exception I can give ever is the Millennium Challenge money, which uh, successfully I think we managed to finish that, uh, complete that, that project. But a lot of these donor agencies, and I've been associated with a lot of them, we don't draw down the money. But the, once the World Bank or any donor agency has set aside money for you, you pay interest even on the ones you don't utilize. So it's part of the reasons why our debt to GDP ratio is high. In the past, there was an instance of donor money which included purchase of piano to somebody's bungalow because these things get listed in the long list of things to be bought. While this waste continues, institutions such as the Attorney General's Department, the Health Ministry and even the Ghana Revenue Authority continue to rely on assistance from donor agencies including the donation of vehicles. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Four children feared dead after school building collapsed on them at Bremen Sekuma in the central region. We'll get details live from our reporter over there. Fellow Ghanaians, corruption or more specifically, the stealing of public funds continues to hold back the development of our country. The grounded vehicles reflect the extent of wastage in government procurement. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Currently, 1,500 units of affordable houses built by the government and commissioned three years ago have been abandoned. This project has cost 180 million US dollars. The 14 million dollar official residence for the vice president has also been abandoned for two years now. Until this is addressed, the president's agenda of Ghana Beyond Aid will only remain a fanciful slogan, while millions of Ghanaians continue to suffer from lack of basic amenities. For Joy Hotline, Manasseh Azore Arena reporting.